I'm Miko Pavlikovsky, and this is Hockey Stack. Generative AI is on everyone's mind. From essays to photorealistic pictures to high quality videos, it has changed the way we think about creativity and intelligence forever. If the AI won't steal your job, but somebody using AI will, then the best defense is to learn how this technology works ASAP. Today, I'm bringing you Mark Liu, the author of Learn Generative AI with PyTorch, a tenured finance professor and the founding director of the Master of Science in Finance program at the University of Kentucky and a veteran coder with over 20 years of experience. In this conversation, we'll talk about learning through doing, how everybody can build generative AI models, the various breakthroughs that allowed for the current AI explosion to take place and make some wild predictions about the future. Welcome to this episode and please enjoy. How are you doing today? Pretty good. Thank you, Miko. Glad to be here. Yeah, I'm very excited. Not only because I'm hoping to learn so many interesting things from your book, but also because I'm very curious. How does somebody who's a founding director of a Master of Science and Finance and a tenured professor in finance decide to go into AI? Tell us a little bit about your story. It goes back to like five years ago. In 2017, our department wanted to launch a Master of Science in Finance program. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I've been tenured for about five years. I was uh, always very adventurous, trying to do new things. I was uh, appointed the founding director to start an academic graduate program from scratch. And I was uh, very much into it. It was a lot of work, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. So our program launched in uh, fall of 2017, mm -hmm. and it's a mm -hmm. one-year program. At the end of 2017, we started to place our students. The very first year, we had 30 students in the program, which is a great number. And I talked to many employers, many companies, trying to place our MS finance students. I heard the same thing again and again. They told me that uh, they wanted somebody who not only know finance, but also know coding, programming, analytics. And the uh, number one programming language in finance is Python. And I've been doing programming for many years. So those are mainly statistical software to run regression for the finance research. And then I had to learn Python from scratch in order to teach my students. And it turns out that Python is a very user-friendly programming language. So even if you never programmed before, you can guess what a block of code is trying to accomplish. I started to run Python workshops to MS finance students, and gradually I uh, accumulated a lot of uh, teaching notes. And uh, I also had to convince my students to use Python because some of the students said that I can do everything in Excel. Why should I learn Python, right? Mm -hmm. And then I told mm -hmm. them that Excel is not exactly a programming language and you do need a programming language in order to automate things, to make things more convenient, bigger programs, that kind of stuff. So what I did was I started to uh, create a fun project in finance like uh, speech recognition and text-to-speech. So one example would be I add uh, uh, those features to a finance calculator. What you can do is that you can actually speak to a computer and ask the computer to do a finance calculation. You can tell the program in a human voice what is the uh, present value of $1,000 in five years. Mm -hmm. And then the program will do the calculation and tell you the answer in a human voice. And then that caught the student's attention. So I started to do those kind of applications. And then after a year or so, I had plenty of projects. And then 
some students told me they should write a book about it. So I started to send the manuscript to No Starch Press to publish the book. The moment my colleagues or my students or a lot of my friends, even my family members, heard that I'm writing a programming book in Python about the speech recognition and the text to speech, their first reaction was, I thought you were a finance professor. <laughs> so that question came up again and again. And then I give them a famous quote by uh, a chief risk officer from Deutsche Bank. Banks are essentially technology firms now. So there is a lot of truth in that because in order to be in the field of finance, you need to know a lot of technology, no programming, no analytics and so forth. So that was my first book in 2020. It finally published in 2021. So I think I signed a contract with them in 2019. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I started to teach a course in the MS Finance program. So it's called Python Predictive Analytics. So we use Python to do machine learning models for business analytics. And I started to teach students a lot of machine learning models, including deep neural networks. And then again, I accumulated a lot of notes. And then I came across a video from DeepMind showing how you can actually play Atari games, like Breakout, by training a computer program to play the game at a superhuman level. So what happened was not only the computer program learned to play the game, it actually figured out a way to score very efficiently, a way human beings didn't know before. So you dig a tunnel at the side of the wall, and then you send the ball to the back of the wall to score it very efficiently. When I saw that video, I was completely amazed. <laughs> I told myself, I got to figure out how this works. I spent several months experimented with different kind of programs, trying to figure out how it works. And eventually I figured out. And that came my second book. It's Machine Learning Animated. So it's published with CRC Press mm -hmm. last year. And then recently, once ChatGPT was out, uh, Generative AI, was very popular. I was very curious. I was trying to figure out how exactly a large language model works and uh, how a computer program can understand the human language. I spent a lot of time trying to figure it out. Before I was actually using TensorFlow, it worked pretty well for me with uh, Atari games and so on and so forth. Apparently, it's not great in terms of GPU training. You can do GPU training, but uh, there is a, an overhead. So you have to program everything in CPU and then send it to the GPU, do the calculation, and then send it back. The overhead is just too much. So it ended up not very fast. Then I learned another uh, AI framework called PyTorch. You can uh, explicitly send a tensor to GPU to do the calculation and so on and so forth. It's a little more complicated than TensorFlow because you do have to send something to GPU and then get it back. So in terms of coding, you have to do a slightly more work. But in terms of performance, it's amazing. So I get to train models uh, seven to 10 times faster compared to CPU training. As all those large language models, they have billions or hundreds of billions of uh, parameters, right? Yeah. So the speed is crucial. 
Right now, I'm in like training a model with millions of parameters, which is fine. So for even larger kind of language models, in my third book, which is with many publications. So in this book, I'm doing generative AI with PyTorch. The reason I switched to PyTorch is because of dynamic computing graph and then the GPU training, I can train most of the models in a matter of minutes. Sometimes, like the larger ones, maybe a couple of hours. That's it. I can see the model in action and then I can tune the model. So that's the third book. So let me conclude by quickly summarizing what I'm doing in the third book. The name, I think you just mentioned at the beginning, Learn Generative, generative AI with PyTorch. Readers learn to create generative AI models from scratch to create the different contents like images, shapes, numbers, text, music, sound, and so forth, all with PyTorch and deep learning models. And in particular, readers learn how to create a chat GPT style a transformer from scratch. And then in particular, I teach readers how to create a GPT-2 XL with 1.5 billion parameters. Of course, with 1.5 billion parameters, it's very hard to train, right? It's very slow, number one. Number two, GPT-2 was trained with huge amounts of data and the regular readers don't have access to this training data, right? But I also teach readers how to extract the pre-trained weights from OpenAI, and then you uh, load those weights into the GPT-2 model you created from scratch and start to generate the text. So the text you generate is uh, very coherent, uh, without grammar errors, it's amazing. Of course, it's not as powerful as ChatGPT, GPT-4, but a normal person without access to super uh, computing facilities, without access to larger amounts of training data, can create uh, a ChatGPT style, deep neural network from scratch, and use it to generate uh, text, and generate that lifelike music is amazing. And that's the text part. On the Im image part, you can create like a color image. You can also convert a horse to a zebra. <laughs> you can convert a blonde hair to black hair in images. You can add or remove glasses in images, sound and so forth. So the whole experience is amazing. It worked better than uh, anticipated, and that whole experience reminded me of famous quote, technology advanced enough is indistinguishable from magic. The whole thing is really magic. That's my long answer to your question. <laughs> Thank you for that. Just for anybody who's not familiar with Manning, the book is currently available in what's called MEEP. That's for Manning Early Access Program. You can read the chapters as they are produced by Mark. So at the moment, there is five chapters that are available, but I'm being told that 11 will be coming very soon. And the estimated time for the whole book to be available is May 2024. So for anybody who's eager and who might be thinking that the book is not finished yet, you can actually start reading it right now. Speaking of the magic and the building from scratch, I think what I liked the most about your book and what initially attracted me to actually go and read it is that build from scratch thing. And I love that you used the Richard Feynman's uh, philosophy, the, the quote, what I cannot create, I, I do not understand. I think that's a, that's a very good motto to, to live by. It's, it's absolutely great that uh, you, you take us on this journey to, to build things up, uh, even though I've only read the five chapters so far. <laughs> All of a sudden with ChatGPT, everybody started talking about this and this explosion. 
what were some other moments other than chat GPT where you realized, mm. oh man, this is going to blow up. This is going to be massive with generative AI. I, I believe you mentioned the Writers Guild of America versus AI story. Right. Can we talk about that for a minute? Before I answer the, that question, I encourage you to read my chapter one for free. Even if you don't have to buy my book, money has a great feature. If you go to money.com and if you look for my book, Learn Generative AI with PyTorch, you can find it. I have a fairly long chapter one summarizing the state of the art in generative AI and also what I'm doing in the book. What Miko talking about, the Writer Guild of America. So a few months ago, they negotiated with the big firms about the threat of AI. And as a result, it's a contract to limit how much AI you can use in writing, in production, in order to protect the jobs of the writers. And this is just one example of the disruptive power of AI in many different uh, industries. Writers is just one example, and it uh, threatens many other uh, industries. Another example is Checkmate, which is an online educational platform. So college students go there to get a tutoring service and so forth. And with the chat GPT, actually, their business model is threatened, right? I think in the month after the release of chat GPT, their stock price plunged by almost 40%. So that's how serious the competition is. Those are just a couple of examples. The potential of generative AI is huge. But at the same time, if you don't catch up with the trend, there is a risk that your job might be replaced by AI. There is an interesting quote. I think there is a lot of truth in it. It says that AI will not take your job. Somebody using AI will. So I think there is a lot of truth in that. So in order to avoid being replaced by AI, I think the best strategy is to get in the game to learn about generative AI, to protect yourself in terms of future careers. So that's the big motivation behind my books. The main motivation, of course, is intellectual curiosity. I'm by nature a very curious person. So when I saw like chat GPT works like you know, magic, I really want to get it to the bottom of it and trying to figure out how it works. So that's the main reason. But at the same time, I'm trying to teach my students programming skills, machine learning skills, AI skills, generative AI skills in order to prepare them for the job market so that in the future, their skill sets will not be outdated. That's my second motivation for writing the books. Do you buy into this comparison that um, AI is like personal computers and that the people were worried about how personal computers were going to just remove jobs. But what ended up happening was some small portion of jobs was eliminated, but most of the jobs were modified and became operating computers. Do you think that's the most apt comparison of what we're likely to experience with AI in the coming years? The future is hard to predict, but personally, I think most likely that's what's going to happen in the near future. If generative AI, you can actually use it to increase your productivity, to have more job opportunities. On the other hand, if you basically completely stay away from it, your skill sets might be outdated. But at the same time, I think technology will make uh, all this like AI stuff more accessible to most people, right? You don't necessarily have to be a programmer. So one example is mid journey, right? So you can actually just go to a browser and then you can use mid journey or DALI 2, DALI 3 or whatever 
to create uh, very fancy images. You can use a text prompt to create an image of what you meant. You don't have to draw yourself. In that sense, I'm optimistic. I think uh, for most people, generative AI will be a very valuable tool to increase their productivity as long as you keep up with the technology. I'm glad you mentioned mid-journey because I think for me personally, that was when I realized, okay, this is the hockey stick moment because I remember the little tiny pictures blurry from the gun paper. And then all of a sudden I saw some pictures that were generated by mid-journey and I went and I, I tried it myself. And it was more or less able to produce almost everything I threw at it other than some particular types of dinosaurs that just didn't recognize. <laughs> that was like the one thing I knew, okay, they didn't train it on that kind of dinosaur. But that was definitely one of those moments where I realized, wow. And the other is, I think I live in London, one way or another, you end up using the tube a lot. And usually you're annoyed at people who play some music on like public transport. And then at some point, I realized that I was getting annoyed at people talking about generative AI <laughs> on, the, on, the, on the public transport and making noise. Okay. And so, that's when you realize that, okay, so this has now gone mainstream and, and everybody's talking about that. But let's talk a little bit about the actual underlying breakthroughs that brought us to where we are. And in particular, I'm thinking about GAN, the generative adversarial networks and transformers and diffusion, where should we start? Okay. What's the first important breakthrough that everybody should know about? I think all the generative AI models in my book or deep neural networks, machine learning is a very wide field. There are many traditional machine learning models, random forest, linear regressions, this and that. But about 20 years ago, Deep neural networks became very powerful. But one great thing about the neural networks is that you can scale it. And the deep neural network can approximate any relationship, uh, even if we human beings don't know what's the exact relationship, as long as you create a large enough model to capture it. So that's, that's the foundation 20 years ago. And then over the past 20 years or so, many big breakthroughs in deep learning field. And then let's talk about it like a chat GPT. Okay. So chat GPT is a huge deep neural network trained on huge amounts of data. And before that, state of the art, natural language processing models are recurrent neural networks. So how it works was it progresses on the timeline. Let's say you have a sentence, like this is a sentence, right? So you have like four words in the sentence, right? The model uses the first word, this, to predict the second word, as, and then it uses the first two words to predict the third word and so on and so forth. It worked to some degree. But it's very slow because you have to predict one word at a time. And then in 2017, there is a, a huge breakthrough. There's a paper called Attention is All You Need by a group of Google scholars. And they used a different mechanism to capture the relationship of different words in a sentence. So it's called the attention mechanism. And uh, it's much more effective on top of that. It's not sequential. So which means uh, one word can pay attention to all other words at the same time. And this allows for parallel training. And this has huge implications. Number one, uh, it works better in terms of capturing long-term relationships between different words in a sentence so that you can understand the meaning of a long sentence, long text, number one. Number two, because of the long sequential nature of attention mechanism, you can use parallel training. You can paint the same model on many different devices. This makes training much faster. 
And this also allows you to train the model on more data. That's why ChatGPT became so powerful. Uh, because you can train the much faster, and then you can train the on more data. On top of that, the mechanism works much better than recurrent neural networks because it can capture really, really long-term relationships in a sequence, like as uh, a text is a sequence, right? And that propelled uh, OpenAI to have all these models, including ChatGPT. Now let's go to the recent development, the text to image transformers. This is a new innovation in transformer models called uh, multimodal models. The original transformer model, attention is all you need, which powers the channel GPT. They only use text, right? So the input is a sequence of text. The output is also a sequence of text. But uh, uh, multimodal models, the input and the output can be different formats, right? Uh, DALI 2, DALI 3, the input is a text and the output is an image, right? You can have different inputs, outputs, you can have audio, you can have video, Sora basically has videos, that kind of stuff. But let's talk about what is the underlying mechanism behind multimodal models, DALI 2, DALI 3. It has something to do with diffusion models. So I think you mentioned that at first, the generated image is very grainy, right? Diffusion models adds noise to an image gradually. Let's say it's all like 1,000 time steps. And then at each time step, you can actually add a little bit of noise to the image. And gradually, uh, you have uh, 1,000 different images. And each one becomes progressively noisier. And at the end, it becomes completely noise. And then what you can do is that you can give those images to a machine learning model. And you can train the model to remove those noises progressively, step by step. That's how DALI uh, and all those text-to-image models work. First step is that you use a text prompt to generate a very grainy image. And then after that, you use a model, which is very much like the theorem models. You will progressively refine those models so that you turn a very grainy image into a high resolution image. That's why when you enter a, like a short prompt, and then DALI2 can give you a high resolution image capturing what you are trying to uh, produce in the text prompt. So that's actually chapter 14 of my book. I'm going to talk about how you can add a little bit of noise to the image one step at a time, and then you can use those images to train the model to remove the noise step by step progressively, and very much like Ali2 trying to make the image clearer and clearer step by step progressively. Right. And then we also got the, the generative adversarial networks, which was an mm -hmm. interesting development from Ian Goodfellow. How does that fit into the rest of what you just described? Generative adversarial networks. So it's great at generating different forms of content, right? A lot of times when readers learn something, if you give them the end product, it's too complicated, right? So they make it frustrated and they just give up. Okay. As an author, my job is how to make sure readers stay engaged throughout the book and they never get tired, never get frustrated, and they gradually learn and finally learn to do the state of the art, machine learning models, generative AI models like a chat GPT style transformer to generate uh, text and uh, audio, right? So what is the idea behind uh, GANs? You have two networks. One is a generator network. The other one is a 
discriminate network. So the job of the generator is trying to generate a piece of work similar to that from the training data set. Let's use a grayscale image as an example, right? You have a training data set of grayscale images of 180 digits, like 0 to 9. And then those are the real images. And then you will ask the generator to generate something similar to that so that it can pass as real in front of the discriminator okay before you train the model the generator is terrible so whatever the generator generated is completely uh, like a gibberish it's like a flow snake on a screen that kind of stuff but this is where training comes in you will have a training loop and then in each iteration you will ask the generator to generate a bunch of fake images at the same time you also have a bunch of real images from the training set and you give all those to the discriminator and ask the discriminator to determine whether each image is real or fake and then Generator's job is trying to create an image so that the discriminator would think it's real. That's the generator's objective. So therefore you have a loss function and then you change the model. You gradually fine tune the model parameters so that, so that in the next iteration, whatever image generated by the generator will have a higher probability of passing as real. And then you do this again and again. You can do it thousands of iterations. And if you do that long enough, then eventually the generator will be able to create an image identical to the image from the training set. So that's how game works. And you have a zero sum game. You have a competitive kind of two networks competing with each other, trying to outsmart each other, and eventually the generator gets better and better. So that's the idea behind uh, uh, GANs. It's a revolutionary idea. In 2014, 2015, Ian Goldfinner and uh, his co-authors proposed the model. A great thing about the model is uh, it can generate uh, different content, numbers, images, shapes, even music, sound and so forth. I love this idea because on top of that, you've got this built-in target point, right? When your uh, discriminator can no longer discriminate between what you're generating when you're finished. It's not arbitrary. You've got that. And the other reason why I love that is that it's got this anecdote attached to it that legend has it. It was written one evening when Ian was celebrating in a pub. I think someone was graduating, some fellow students. And they were discussing a problem when they wanted to generate some pictures. And he came up with this idea that, oh, what you're suggesting is too complicated. You should put two networks against each other. And they laughed. <laughs> <laughs> he went home uh -huh. and still slightly drunk. He wrote the proof of concept of that. And then turned out that it actually worked out. I think I, in okay. one of the interviews later, he, he said that if he wasn't drunk, he probably wouldn't have done it because it sounded like a silly <laughs> idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's right. Yes. How random some of those things are. <laughs> How <laughs> weird and unpredicted. And I think one of the things I wanted to ask you about is also what made all of those kind of recent breakthroughs possible? What was missing? Because we've had the neural network since, what, the 80s or something like that. All of a sudden, it looks like in the last few years or maybe last decade or so, it was just like one breakthrough after another breakthrough just dropping. And if you try to keep up with currently written papers on AI, there was just so many of them. And it, it looks like mm -hmm. every other day there is something super interesting that's been developed. And it's literally hard to keep up just with other people's ideas. What do you think mm -hmm. enabled this kind of explosion in the recent years? Mm -hmm. Actually, like neural networks was proposed even earlier than 1980s, I think in 1960s. 
researchers proposed the artificial neural networks, basically modeled after human brain. The idea was a great one. But at that point, we didn't have the hardware to support it. And then started in 1990s, early 2000s, the hardware becomes much more powerful, number one. Uh, number two, there were more research, more breakthroughs in the uh, research field of artificial neural networks. So one example is uh, Lacoon's uh, convolutional neural networks. Most neural networks are fully connected dense neural networks, which means a neuron in the previous layer is connected to all the neurons in the next layer. And it works great, except that once your model becomes larger, the number of parameters grow exponentially, and then it's very hard to train it, right? So that's a problem. Convolutional neural networks is you localize the weights, okay? You have a filter, and then the weights in the filter is fixed. When you move the filter on an image, and then this will greatly reduce the number of parameters. It makes computer vision much more efficient. Because of that, in early 2000s, there were a lot of breakthroughs in computer vision, in convolutional neural networks. And I think that's a huge uh, breakthrough. And then after that, you also have GPU training. GPU training became very popular in the past maybe 10 years or so, and a huge game changer because as deep neural networks became larger and larger, it's very hard to train them without uh, extra help, right? When you train the on CPU, CPU basically is a general purpose kind of processor. You have to do many things on it, but the GPU is specialized. So you can do machine learning jobs much faster. And of course, we also have more and more training data available. And uh, that also is necessary for large language models to work. It takes time, but I think the past uh, 20 years or so, we suddenly have everything came together to make it work. Basically. We've got gamers to thank for the breakthroughs in AI <laughs> because of the graphic cards, the uh -huh. GPUs that they requested, right? They have a very good point. I think a GPU was uh, uh, originally designed for gaming purpose, right? <laughs> and then suddenly right now it has a completely different purpose. And I have uh, several uh, GPUs at home, not very powerful. Uh, I think it's uh, powerful enough for me to experiment on different uh, models. It costs maybe several hundred dollars, thousand uh, dollars. I have three of them. Uh, two of them are from my son. My son was playing video <laughs> games. <laughs> and then now he doesn't use those computers anymore. And then he just give it to me. And then I just simply take them out and uh, use it for now. But uh, the cost is not that much. No, the cost is not that much unless you go for like the top of the line, 80 gig ones, uh, which are very hard to come by <laughs> and also That's quite right. expensive. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So thank you, gamers. Thank you for enabling the AI revolution <laughs> in many ways. It goes back to what I was saying about how random some of these things seem to be. So where do you think we're heading? Like you said, future is notoriously difficult to predict, obviously. But mm -hmm. if you were still going to venture and make a guess, that will probably prove completely wrong a few years down the line. Where do you think we're heading with all of this? If I had to venture to guess, the large language models will become even more powerful in the near future. Uh, not only in terms of uh, generating cohesive uh, uh, text, but also generating uh, images, generating videos, and also model models will become very popular. Okay, you can you can generate uh, not only images, text, you can also generate audio, video, sound, and so forth. Other than that, I think it really depends on which breakthrough will come through in the near future. And you never know, maybe there's just a one day suddenly there is a huge breakthrough and then it will completely change the landscape of AI. 
just like what the uh, chat GPT did a couple of years ago, right? The future is very exciting, but at the same time, like you said, it's very hard to predict. But I think right now is a very fortunate time, a very exciting time for tech enthusiasts, for anybody who is passionate about AI, about technology. It's very exciting. So two follow-up questions then. One, it's like anything else. There are these fashion waves that kind of come and go. And AI is now the latest, hottest thing. So all the VCs, everybody's throwing money at it. But at some point, people will probably move on to the next thing, just like they did with crypto and smartphones and internet and whatever else before, right? So I'm wondering, where do you think we are in that hype cycle and what's going to happen when all of a sudden slapping AI first on your startup no longer <laughs> make sure that you get funding. So that's question number one, follow up. And then the second question is, if you were to plot a graph of how you expect the large language models to continue developing, I think we can all agree that there is some kind of like very exponential growth where somebody figured out ChatGPT or one of these massive models. If you throw enough data at it and you massage it for long enough, you can create this impression of all oh, this is magic. How on earth is that even happening? But then at some point it has to plateau, right? It's not possible for it to go at the kind of speed into the sky. Feeling, uh, again, it's, it's hard to predict the sense. Of course, all the usual disclaimers <laughs> about predictions, <laughs> but what's your take on what it means about us as humans? Does it mean that what we cherish as one of the unique capabilities of humans, the human intelligence, is not actually all that unique? Because it's hard to not have this feeling when you talk to one of those big, large language models and during the time it doesn't go haywire and start behaving weird. But on the times where it works well, it's really hard to not have this impression that you're talking to somebody with some amount of intelligence to it. So does it mean that we're all some kind of statistical models and the, the <laughs> intelligence that we um, demonstrate is also an emerging property? What's your take on that? I don't think many people in the world right now have a good answer to that question. That said, I do want to point out that there are many people right now have concerns about AI because of the potential damage it can do. So it's all about the objective function. So if you give a task to the model and in terms of the last function, and then you can just train it again and again, and eventually it will become very good, whatever objective you want the model to do. So that is good, but at the same time, it can be bad. The AI may not even know it, right? It's just trying to accomplish a certain goal. It just happens that a human being stand in the way of that goal. So in that sense, I do think that the human beings need to be careful. I think like AI needs to be regulated in, to some degree. We cannot let it to do whatever it wants. It may have serious negative consequences to human beings. I think that a lot of what you just described has been the main kind of concern for everybody making sci-fi movies from the Terminator and Skynet. And I, I certainly get that, but I think I'm probably more worried about going back to what we said about you won't be losing your job to AI, you'll be losing your job to someone using an AI. Mm -hmm. I think this mm -hmm. probably applies here too, that you can just do as an enabler, it scales up the amount of damage that nefarious party can actually produce. Because using that to bad ends, a lot of the security that we rely on is practical, right? Like for example, all the encryption keys that we use for everything are only because it would be computationally too expensive to actually figure that out. But then uh, when you've got tools like this, it's easy to be scared about the possibility of that figuring out and making things possible that previously w weren't. 
So I think I'm more worried about that scenario where someone uses the AI to bad ends and it enables mm -hmm. them to do more damage that they would be able to do with traditional methods. And in the current stage, if AI falls into the wrong hands, it can do a lot of damage. Not that catastrophic, but it can do a lot of damage to a lot of families, right? I think there were like stories about people use generative AI to create a fake phone call to their parents and yeah. demand a ransom money. So I think it causes financial damage and also a lot of emotional distress, like fake news, fake video, a lot of deep fake stuff. So even at this stage, I think you can do a lot of harm if you fall into the wrong hands. Yeah, that's a very good example of the call. Like you can technically go and call people and scam and people do that. Mm -hmm. But there is a limit mm -hmm. to how many people you can physically call in a day. <laughs> If on the <laughs> other hand, true. you have a powerful enough AI, you can scale it up and you can probably call everybody in the United States a certain amount of time. That's right, Are you yeah. concerned about the AI involvement in the upcoming election? So we have to be careful, but I think so far the impact is limited. But at the same time, I think all the parties, politicians need to pay attention to generative AI because of what it can do, fake news, so on and so forth. And imagine you are running a political campaign, right? You must get to know analytics, how AI can influence your campaign either positively or negatively. If your team can utilize AI uh, to strengthen your position legally. You're in a very good position. It can help you. But on the other hand, if you're not careful, your opponents or somebody can use deep fake to disrupt uh, your campaign for your cause. That's why I think AI is so powerful and also so widespread. It affects every single industry in the economy, not just uh, a few isolated uh, sectors that's uh, very unique about AI. Did you hear about the Elon Musk lawsuit against OpenAI for a few days ago? Mm -hmm. Obviously, OpenAI initially started as an alternative to the big companies and their massive labs like Google, Facebook, and so on. And their pitch and the initial mission statement was to release everything open source. Now, hence the name, mm -hmm. OpenAI. And then somewhere <laughs> Along the way, that turned, and it's currently a for-profit, closed-source company worth what well, under a hundred billion at the moment. We're recording this on March the fourth, a few days ago. Elon Musk opened this lawsuit, where he alleges that he was basically scammed because <laughs> they turned the the company around and they went against the initial mission. And I think the opinions on the internet vary from okay, this is a jealousy because he's jealous of, of the success that OpenAI has seen to, okay, this is a nice publicity stand. He probably mm -hmm. has a point, but this is probably not going to start standing court. And I'm, you know, trying to make sense of how much of that is actually valid and how much I should be worried about OpenAI <laughs> being at the yeah. forefront of this, a big closed source mm -hmm. company. I also heard that many years ago when Elon Musk and the Sam Altman co-founded the OpenAI, their objective was a non-profit organization. Given the competition from uh, other big players in the industry, I think uh, OpenAI was uh, under pressure to commercialize uh, ChatGPT, and this may go against the original uh, objective. So uh, you know, I can see the argument from both sides. On the one hand, we have to be careful, like we just discussed, about uh, the use of uh, AI. It may need to uh, the end of humanity as we know it, if we're not careful. But at the same time, if we use it properly, it can be a great tool. That's why there is a, such a great market for generative AI. So I think there is uh, some tension 
in the company. So you have uh, different views. That's why I think a few months ago, within several days, Ottoman yeah. was fired or anything, get hired back and so on and so forth. Uh, in the background, I think it's really this, those two forces at play. So the force wants to make sure that uh, AI does not go out of control, harm human beings. And at the same time, it's huge pressure from industry peers to commercialize those applications to make profits. Actually, I'm glad that the mass actually made the lawsuit in the sense that it may swing the pendulum to the other side. So eventually, I think the view that we should commercialize and make money out of it, I think that kind of view prevailed, right? That's why Sam Altman got hired back. But that can go too far because uh, in the process of competition, making profits, you may sacrifice uh, security. So I think uh, the lawsuit by Elon Musk can potentially put the original mission in check, so to speak, and maybe uh, force OpenAI and other tech companies to think more about guardrails around AI to make sure it doesn't go out of control and uh, harm human beings. Time will tell if anything comes out of it other than one billionaire being upset at another, (laughs) but we'll see. So I'm going to ask you for one more prediction and this time a little bit more down to earth. PyTorch. It appears to be still on the rise and it appears to be the kind of go-to option for any new papers. TensorFlow seems to be stagnating a little bit. You talked a little bit about the advantages of PyTorch and why you chose it for your book. And I'm wondering, do you see this being like the prevailing platform? Because now I think that the main kind of breakthroughs for PyTorch was, you mentioned the GPU support, obviously, and also the built-in backpropagation, right? The autograd. Now the other frameworks Mm -hmm. also provide the autograd. So I guess Mm -hmm. they're closing up the gap uh, a little bit in that respect. Mm -hmm. If you were to venture one more crazy prediction, would you see PyTorch Mm -hmm. uh, leading the way going forward? Or Mm -hmm. are you going to update your book in a couple of years to port it to (laughs) some other framework? I think uh, uh, PyTorch is going to, prevail in the near future. So uh, I mentioned this uh, uh, in my book. So what a PyTorch does is using a dynamic computational graph, which means it creates notional graph on the fly so that it's faster, it's more flexible. Ten- TensorFlow is using static computational graph, so it's slower. So that's the main difference and it affects the training speed greatly. So in TensorFlow, you don't really have to worry about which device you're going to use. It's all done at the back end automatically by TensorFlow. But at the cost, if you have industry scale models, and then you have a lot of GPU and you do a huge calculation, maybe the overhead is negligible, it doesn't affect sense much. But uh, for a lot of researchers, it makes a huge difference because we are already working with a lot of toy models, not huge. Therefore, if you use the PyTorch, there is a little bit of inconvenience in the sense that you have to specify whether to move this tensor to GPU. And then once you are done with it, you have to get it back. But the benefit is huge because it greatly increases the training speed. I think like at least for small players, regular readers, and also for researchers around the world, I think a PyTorch is much more convenient, it's much faster. And certain large corporations, they may not care that much. Uh, for regular people, PyTorch is much more convenient, it's much faster, and in the near term, it may win out. For anybody listening to this, I know that if I haven't 
read your book before, I would probably be on manning.com looking at it. And then at some point I would reach chapter four where you're walking us through building a network that does generation of anime faces, <laughs> which I thought was a, a pretty cool example. Um, can you give us a taste for anybody who's going to be doing that? What's the training going to look like? What data we're going to use? How we're going to implement a network? And then in terms of training, what kind of hardware you need for the training to be quick? Mm -hmm. How much time you need to see for that? Give us an idea whether this is something that someone who is comfortable with Python can just pick up on a Sunday on a random weekend and go through or mm -hmm. whether there's any extra prep that's needed. In order to train a GAN model to uh, produce uh, color images of uh, anime faces, obviously you need the training data, right? The research community has a lot of human created uh, data for us to experiment on. So you can actually go to a website, download the anime faces, uh, I think tens of thousands of them. And uh, then you need to create uh, two uh, neural networks. One is a generator, one is a discriminator. And uh, the generator is trying to create an image that can pass as real in front of the discriminator. You just train the model many rounds, and then eventually you will see that the generator is able to generate a, a anime face, which is very much the one from the training set. I want to mention that in order to generate the color images of human faces, you do need to use convolutional neural networks because we mentioned this earlier. So if you use fully connected dense neural networks, there are just too many parameters and then the training will be too slow. So on the other hand, if you use uh, convolutional uh, neural networks, you localize the weights. So the weights will stay the same in a filter and then you move the filter around the image. So this will greatly reduce the number of parameters in the model and make the model training much faster. This is on the software side, on the training side. In terms of hardware, so I trained it using GeForce RTX 2060 like a GPU. I think right now the cost uh, three or 400 bucks is not that expensive. You can easily buy it. Or if you have an older gaming computer, you can just grab it and then put on your computer. Uh, it's very easy to do. You don't really need a lot of knowledge about uh, computer hardware to do it. Nowadays, computers are very user-friendly. Pop it open and change ports and that kind of stuff. So it took me like uh, 30 minutes to one hour to train the model. So it's very fast. However, if you don't really want to bother with the GPU, you can train the same model with the CPU. And what you can do is you can simply leave your computer on overnight. It may take five, six, or seven hours, but it can be easily done overnight. You just, uh, you know, leave the program on, go to sleep next morning, you see the result. So in that sense, computationally, it's not that costly. I think the most complicated model would be chapter six. You have to convert like a horse image into a zebra image. It's called a cycle game. And then you have to convert like a blonde hair to black hair in images or black hair to blonde hair. Those kind of models is a little bit more time consuming because you are using higher resolution, number one. Number two, you are actually training two generators and two discriminators. Okay. So what how CycleGAN works is that you have two generators. Let's use a horse and a zebra as the example, how to convert a horse image to a zebra image, right? So you have two generators. One generator is called the a horse generator, the other one is called a zebra gener generator. So what is a horse generator does is it takes in a zebra image 
and convert it into a horse image. And then what the zebra Im、uh, generator does is that it will take a horse image and convert it into a zebra. And then you also have two discriminators. The horse discriminator will tell whether an image is a horse image or not. And then the zebra discriminator will tell if an image if is a zebra image or not. And then cycle gun has another element. The、uh, loss function has a component called cycle loss. So what do you do? So I think the idea is really. Engineers. That's why I mentioned that、uh, with the right loss function, you can achieve anything. Originally, you have、uh, a horse image, right? And then you、uh, give that image to a zebra generator to create a fake zebra image. Okay. Now you will use that fake zebra image as input to the horse generator, and ask the horse generator. Convert the fake zebra image into a fake horse image. Now here is the key: if both generators does their job right, then the fake horse image you got will be identical to the original horse image. So that's called a cycle gain. So cycle loss is trying to minimize the loss between. The original horse image and the fake horse image after a round trip. That's a very powerful tool because that forces the model, both models, both the zebra generator and the horse generator, to generate realistic images. So since your show is called、uh, Hockey Stick. I think that's like a, when I was like trying to experiment the different models. I think that. It's pretty much like a hockeystick moment. When I saw that, I said this, this is like a cycle loss is really ingenious because that component in the loss function is crucial for you to successfully convert a horse image into a zebra and a zebra image into a horse. When I saw that, I was completely amazed, not just by how well the model works, but also by The engineers mechanism devised by the researchers. Again, there are tons of smart people in the profession. So sometimes when I see what they are doing, and once I understand what they are doing, I was completely amazed. I said this this method is amazing. The author must be a genius. I think there are tons of genius in our profession. Love that story, and also FYI, I'm totally stealing the quote from you with the right、mm -hmm. loss function. You can achieve anything. <laughs> I think this should go on a T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, with the right loss function, you can achieve anything. <laughs> That's my belief. The, the 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 concept of the loss function is very powerful. You know, so loss function is another way of saying the objective function. Right, you are telling the model what to achieve, what to do. It's very powerful. Yeah, yeah. I think what what keeps striking me is that once you go and look into these ideas, they're not actually that complicated. There's not too much magic in it. But to come up with that idea initially, be the first one to to put propose that, it does require certain a level of genius. So I think、mm -hmm. probably decades from now, kids will be learning a lot of that stuff in primary school or or, or early in their education.、Mm -hmm. And、yeah. it it just feels like we're really experiencing some kind of breakthrough in this profession,、mm -hmm. a, a hockey stick yeah. moment. <laughs> Absolutely, it's good that a lot of smart researchers are working in the field, and sometimes when you get stuck on a question, you may work on it for years, right, without any breakthrough, and then suddenly once you like struck down it year after year, suddenly there is aha moment. And then you figure out the way to tackle the problem, and it worked. And then the method may become revolutionary. It may completely change the field. You're about to finish your book. Is there anything that you would do differently if you were starting to write it today? Would you、mm -hmm. make any different <laughs> choices? 
Good question. I don't think there are many things I would change. The reason is because even though it's a new book, actually I have been working on it for a couple years now. So I have a GitHub repository before I submit a proposal to Manning's. So it's my way of working things out. A couple of years ago, I started to use PyTorch for machine learning models, and I started to get into generative AI, and then I started to use the PyTorch to generate the shapes, images, and then eventually I get into natural language processing, large language models, and then I had a lot of projects on my computer. The writing book is my way of organizing things, to think things through, to make sure everything works out. But I know that in order to write a compelling proposal, I need to first prepare well, right? Especially there are not too many good publishers out there. So you only have one shot with a good publisher. Like money is one of the great publishers. Over the years, I've read many books from money and I really enjoyed their books. And uh, I knew that uh, I needed to write a good proposal in order to work it out. I don't want to blow the chance. So what I did was uh, in the summer, I spent it a several months to create a huge GitHub repository. So I lay out all the chapters, initially like the first draft, mm -hmm. and it had uh, 17 chapters. And each chapter, I use a Jupyter notebook to explain everything to the best of my ability, all the codes are there. So it's pretty much like a book. Once I have that, then I spend another month to convert it into an actual book, a PDF file. A lot of tech people use Latex. Latex is only a word processing software, right? Especially if you have a lot of math, you yeah. can actually generate like a beautiful equation. My book has some like an equation, some math, but not a whole lot. But the force is me to go through everything one more time in the process of converting the GitHub uh, repository into a PDF file. I spent a lot of months converting everything. And also it looks beautiful because uh, it looks exactly like a book. You have a template, you have a cover, you have a table of content, you have each chapter, what is section number, what is the section title, what is the subsection title, so on and so forth. You have images. In short, it's pretty much like a book to be published. And then I send that to Manny in the summer, along with the PDF file, along with the proposal file. And then I have a link to the GitHub page. And then what Manny did was send the book proposal to more than 10 reviewers in the profession. Oh, the, the, the reviewers are all data scientists, people who know AI in the profession, and they give comments on whether this book should be published, and then they give a lot of very valuable feedback. The feedback uh, was very positive, partly because it's a hot topic, partly because I spent a lot of time preparing it, right? Mm -hmm. But I did receive a lot of good feedback. To answer your question is, uh, because I have been through it several rounds, now, there are not much I would change because I have already incorporated some feedbacks, great feedbacks from about the 12 reviewers on the proposal. Fair enough. How many copies have you sold so far? It's already sold more than a thousand copies. I think like uh, the daily high was 58. So it says a lot about the demand for generative AI. And uh, if you look at uh, the top 10 from Manning website every week, you will see generative AI is hot. 
a lot of demand. And another trend is Python and PyTorch. I think that's a lot of people are you are switching to PyTorch. And I think there is a book from mining called Deep Learning with PyTorch. It's the same very well. And then there's another book called Large Language Models from Scratch. Actually, the book is also using PyTorch, just <laughs> like, as I do. But that book focuses just on large language models. But my book focuses on many different contents, like large language models, music, images, shapes, numbers, so on. and then uh, another thing I want to mention is that I did spend a lot of time thinking about how to help readers learn progressively, step by step. Chapter one, of course, is an overview of the book of the generative AI landscape and what the book is trying to accomplish. Chapter two is deep learning with PyTorch. So even if readers have no background using PyTorch, after reading chapter two, they will be able to use PyTorch to create deep learning models from A to Z. You have like end to end. You can do the whole thing, okay? So that's very important. And then chapter three, we get into GANs. So you will use GANs to generate numbers and the shapes. So the models are very simple. You only have two or three layers of neurons in those models. So therefore, it's very easy to understand. It's easy to create. And uh, training takes a matter of minutes. Readers will not uh, get frustrated because everything is so simple. And then in chapter four, I kick things up a notch. So instead of using fully connected dense layers, I use uh, uh, convolutional layers that's needed for uh, image processing if you want to create a high-resolution uh, color images. Fully connected dense layers won't work. It may work, but it's very slow. On the other hand, if you use convolutional layers, it's much faster because you use a filter to move around the image, and then the, you just train the weights in the filter. That's much more efficient, that kind of stuff. And then, so people learn to use uh, convolutional layers in chapter four to generate the color image. And then in chapter five, uh, I kick things up another level. To, so readers learn to select characteristics in images. So you can choose to generate uh, an image with eyeglasses or without eyeglasses. You can transition from an image with glass to an image without glasses. Uh, so all those arithmetic kind of stuff. And then chapter six is not out yet, but I will do the second guy is computationally costly because of the reason I just mentioned, because they have two generators, two discriminators. Uh, and then chapter seven is about variational autoencoders. That's a different model from GAN, but it's important because it has a encoder decoder kind of architecture, which is very common in machine learning models. For example, ChatGPT is like a decoder only model. The original transformer paper retention is all you need, has like an encoder part and a decoder part, that kind of stuff. And then after that, I get into transformers, natural language processing, how to do tokenization, how to create a transformer from scratch, including like a chat GPT style. Uh, you can create a GPT from scratch. Uh, you can train it. I, I saw that you have several posts on LinkedIn about how to create a GPT from scratch, right? My book does exactly that in chapter 10 how to create a GPT from scratch. And then chapter 11 is how to create a small GPT from scratch and then train it to generate text. It's focused not mainly on creating, but on training a GPT from scratch. Of course, it's much smaller. It only has 5 million parameters, but you learn how to train a model from scratch. And then after that, it's music generation and then diffusion models and then how you can use uh, Nanchin to chain together different large language models. So that's uh, the whole book. It's been a real pleasure 
to to talk to you. I'm personally super excited. I can't wait until the rest of the chapters become available. So, you know, hurry up. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. before I let you go, I'm curious whether you have your next idea for your next book already in mind or whether you're <laughs> going to take a small break before book number four. So far, I'm very busy with uh, writing the current book. I do get ideas uh, from time to time. One example is, uh, I think this is uh, text to image, like a multimodal model thing is uh, amazing. I think there could be another book there, just focus purely on diffusion models and multimodal transformers how to convert a text to image or convert a text to video. There could be a book there. I thought about it, but I didn't spend a lot of time on it because I'm busy writing the current book. And the other idea I thought about is, so this is also related to multimodal models. My first book is called Make a Python Talk, right? But it's actually using Google API to do the actual speech trans. Uh, speech recognition, text-to-speech. Uh, I don't do any machine learning part, so I just use the Google API to do all the heavy lifting. But there are like open source models out there. You can actually train a model to do speech recognition. So that's actually a multimodal model, right? Because speech recognition, basically the input is audio, output is text, right? And then you can also do text to speech. It can be another uh, interesting project. I have some ideas on how they work, but I do have to spend a lot of time to experiment. So I would say in another two or three years, I may venture into one of those ideas and maybe write another book about it. Awesome. You're going to have one reader already interested in that. So definitely go for okay. it. Okay, let me ask you, then. <laughs> which idea do you like better? The uh, speech recognition model or just a book uh, about uh, text-to-image, multimodal transformer? Which, which idea do you like better? I've been meaning to properly read the, the Whisper paper. So mm -hmm. I think the speech recognition is actually a, a pretty good use case. Okay. Um, I would I definitely see. be interested in reading that. Good to know. I may put more emphasis on that project. Awesome. I do like the feedback. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And hopefully I'll get you next time with your next book. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you.